ZK right now is a black box, right? Like there's a lot of math involved. And the more that we can open that up, the more that we can create standards, the more that we can get people comfortable with what's going through the black box and maybe abstract away some of that tech, like technical complexity to make it like a CXO level conversation where people just understand it, but also understand what's happening. It's another episode of Mind with Coin Fund. My name is David Pakman. I'm head of venture investments and one of the managing partners here at Coin Fund. And I'm sitting here with my partner and friend and Coin Fund's founder, Jake Brookman. Jake, let me be another voice this week wishing you and our firm a happy nine years. Absolutely incredible what you and our team have built. And it still feels like we're just getting started. I'm so excited about the future. Absolutely. Thanks, David. And of course, uh, we learned so much from working with you and your experience and expertise in venture capital, as well as building our firm together with you for from the early innings. It's been a crazy week, not just because of the election action, but we launched our podcast here. We had our happy hour in New York City with about 400 people who signed up to celebrate nine years of crypto fund. And maybe the thing that struck me was how many faces are still in crypto nearly 10 years later. New York does not get enough credit for the energy of its crypto community. I still love the city. I think it's the best crypto city in the US. Yeah, I agree The sort of both the New York activity and the specifically crypto community is frenetic and it does feel like early Silicon Valley when I moved out there in the 90s. I was looking around at the beer garden the other night and it felt it was buzzing. Like there are a lot of younger people, super smart entrepreneurs looking for opportunity, new ideas, new faces to a lot of excitement and cake. It was great that we served cake and bring out milk bar and they will come. It was great. Definitely got a lot of positive reviews on the cake. Do you have a favorite memory, Jake, over the last nine years of building Coin Fund? Or I don't know, maybe a better question is, if you think back all the moments along the way, is crypto today where you thought it was going to be? Definitely not. It's been a huge learning process. I think in 2015, we were certain that, you know, decentralized applications in 2016 would be fully adopted by the mainstream world. In 2017, you know, you would have decentralized exchange and DeFi everywhere, but um, that definitely did not happen. Um, it's been a process of iteration, building up the infrastructure and kind of getting broader acceptance for these technologies in the world, which I think is really happening this year. I don't know if I have a favorite memory, but when I was at the happy hour, there was someone who came, who we originally met at like the end of 2016, early 17, and just reminded me of how dedicated people are to this area, to this industry and their longevity in it. So that was super welcoming and felt homey to be in New York and to be with people who have been so aligned for so long. I think my um, favorite memory was, is your fedora stage. <laughs> That's right. If people who are clever can do a little bit of YouTube sleuthing and find a lot of ICO founder interviews that I did back in, in those days. Anyway, I think one of the privileges of the position that our firm coin fund is in as a crypto native early stage firm is sort of seeing these emerging and iterating verticals in real time and one of those is the vertical of zero knowledge and so i'm very proud to have stacia carson on the show today stacia is the co-founder of one of our portfolio companies called sindri the zero knowledge developer cloud hey stacia welcome to the show hey how are you guys and thanks for having me. Stacia, if our listeners are deep in crypto, but perhaps not as super deep in, you know, AI and zero knowledge, maybe you can kick us off by giving us layman's definition of zero knowledge or an overview. And also, like, maybe we can talk a little bit about why it's important right now. Yeah, for sure. I'd say like a, a very short crash course on ZK um, is that I can essentially prove something, say like a message or a statement, and 
in the digital lens, this is referred to often as a computation. And, and I can give that message or statement and, and prove that it's correct without ever needing to divulge any other information other than whether or not that message or computation is true or false. And in this context, a message or a statement can in fact be any form of computation. I, I recall when I was first learning about the space, um, somebody appropriately said, you know, any signal can essentially be a format for a computation. And so, you know, that layman's sort of crash course definition, it, it may seem a bit trivial, but when we overlay that on, on top of uh, some of our most critical systems today, you know, it's at that point we can get a better view of like where things that are rooted in computation may be significantly impacted if uh, not verified. So for instance, like ensuring inputs to an AI model belonging to like a Fortune 500 company haven't been altered or manipulated in, in a way to create like very devastating downstream impacts, um, proving that data backhaul from a drone that potentially operating in like some adversarial environment hasn't been tampered with or re-engineered, or, you know, even where we spend a lot of our time at Sindri and obviously CoinFund as well, is ensuring that the state of trillions of dollars on the blockchain is accurate without needing to rerun that entire blockchain yourself. And so ZK solves all of this and it does so while unlocking this very, like what we've referred to as a very scalable and verifiable future where a few things are true that are really important and start to provide some definition around, you know, how we can architect the future. Those points are the fact that information can be trusted, calculations can be proven correct, systems can handle massive amounts of data, and privacy and security are built in. And we can get a little bit more into to Sindri, but Sindri is, in essence, creating those tools and really using ZK in a way that will allow technology to grow bigger and more powerful while also making sure that it remains trustworthy and reliable. So, so that, I think that's a decent overview, but happy to dive in further. Yeah, thanks. I, I just want to stay on that for like one second, because this is one of those areas where the implications, you know, like zero knowledge is enabling, you know, essentially verified computation as to what you said. But the implications of that might not be obvious to people. So maybe, you know, Station, what does the world look like when verifiable computation is everywhere? Like, what is this like ZK endgame or verifiable computation endgame that people are, are talking about? Yeah, so I think that trend sends into uh, a variety of different, a variety of different spaces. So on one hand, we can and, and let's just maybe isolate this to a blockchain setting is we can, you know, make the blockchain environment much more sophisticated. We can bring off chain data and off chain compute on chain in a way that's verifiable and trusted. And we can do so with certainty because it's all based on like some really complex math primitives as it extends into broader spaces like AI and like, you know, sort of just communication flow generally, we can apply ZK in a way that ensures that what we're receiving in this very pervasive digital world is in fact true and of high integrity as well. So I think that the implications are far reaching beyond just crypto. I think that, you know, internally at Sindri, we view it not as a crypto paradigm, but as a global paradigm. And in doing so, think that ZK plays a large role in sort of facilitating this future of digital verifiable trust. It's probably easy for our listeners to imagine the current world where so much of the information we're receiving can't be trusted. Humans are doing a really good job of exaggerating ourselves and saying things that aren't true and with, without a whole lot of cost to that, it seems. But we're also in this world now with synthetic data created by AI, which, you know, by definition is synthetic and not real and easy to mislead. So you're painting a picture of a world where we can use zero knowledge as a way to verify all the data and all the computation on that data as inputs into any model or equation or software. Maybe you could tell us what role will Sindri play in this future and kind of what's the true north of the company? Like what's your reason for existing? Yeah. You know, I think that what th there's like massive potential, and I think what listeners 
and then the podcast might realize is that beneath this massive potential is this really, truly developer nightmare, at least in its current form. And that makes adoption super difficult and driving things into sort of mainstream utility becomes a little bit more complicated as well. And so we at Sindri turn what is otherwise like a very super tall task for developers into an API call and driving down engineering effort to the equivalent of say, like spinning up a Shopify website or perhaps like integrating Stripe. And so how we categorize Sindri is we are a ZK infrastructure automation platform that allows any developer or team across any ecosystem. And in our minds, that's web two and web three and across any of these ZK frameworks to run an end-to-end -end ZK infrastructure pipeline with only an API call. So we're known for a few things. One is our ability to turn zero knowledge proof generation into a very serverless API developer experience. That's replacing entire DevOps pipelines with only a few lines of code. Uh, second is our product scale developer time. And we do this by eliminating really complex DevOps tasks that, and hardware configuration that's often required for running these proving systems. And this in turn frees up, frees up teams to focus on user acquisition, product development, volume growth, and revenue generation. So today, you know, how, where we're leaving our mark is with our customers that are typically rollups, typically ZK VMs and ZK applications, primarily in, in the web three space. And these are all applications that are seeking to leverage ZK technology without having to manage the in-house infrastructure overhead as it relates to sort of like our North star and, and sort of how we're looking to grow the space, you know, we fundamentally believe that in order for ZK to prosper, that the tooling must be open, it must be accessible. And at, really importantly, and what we drive towards every day here is it must mirror like a developer experience that's become very standard across other modern paradigms. And we just happen to be like very deeply passionate about solving that problem at the infrastructure layer. And yeah, that's where we spend a good amount of our time as it relates to interfacing with ZK and crypto today. Just you one got... quick follow-up to that. So what are some examples of data types that you think will be encoded with ZK, if you will, or protected by ZK, or what will be the first, the first mainstream developer use cases for ZK that we expect to really you know, bring to the market? Yeah, I think today we're seeing a lot of the initial use cases around scalability on the blockchain. I think that like I typically ascribe to this notion that great technology has a knack to shine over time. And I think that as we view sort of the data types and the use cases and sort of where, where this can go, um, we see the space very similar, but also different. Uh, and it touches a little bit on what we talked about earlier. Whereas we see like web three and I'm, I'm quoting Jake Brockman here, but we see web three as a substrate for ZK, but that verifiable computation is a global paradigm and not just a crypto paradigm. And thus it's part of our mission to bring this verifiable compute uh, towards a digital and global standard. So there's a lot of promise here as to how we can make blockchains more secure, how we can make them more open, more accessible and, and primarily more sophisticated. I think right now, a lot of the skeptics are focused on like, where is demand coming from? And I think that's a, a reasonable critique and sort of what we're getting at with this question here. But ultimately, I think where we're going to see a lot of the most adoption is going to be in the form of scaling blockchains, making them more enterprise friendly and more scalable and, and usable for, you know, for the future builders that are looking to build some really awesome stuff on top. Stacia, I really love that view of kind of ZK going beyond blockchains in some sense, but I actually, because, because, you know, the space of the applications of ZK, I think, as you're noting, is actually, you know, much wider than just blockchains. Like it's applicable to computation in general, but I don't think that story takes away from the decentralization story either, because I see zero knowledge as essentially a decentralization technology. And like, what I mean by that is, um, you know, we've seen sort of the rise of the internet. We've seen these big companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon, et cetera, become really centralizing forces because they are able to facilitate transactions of various kinds between users. And they have 
you know, really want a great deal of trust. Like it's effective. Trust is, you know, once you establish trust, it's cheap to have trust as a kind of hardness mechanism that ensures, you know, the transactions are going through. Now what's happening with zero knowledge is now suddenly we're going more into a world where I don't need a middleman trust or facilitation to have a transaction with you directly where you also have a very high confidence, you know, that transaction is correct. Right. And so yeah. like you guys are essentially making the production of proofs, cheap, effective, developer friendly, you know, but the effect that Sindri will have on the world is a proliferation and ease of use of zero knowledge. And the more zero knowledge there is in the world, the more decentralization there's going to be in the world. That's my argument. I think that's a very interesting take and definitely aligns with some of our ethos that we carry as a company. And perhaps we can get a little bit more into it. But I think that at the core of what you're saying, you know, in principle, we can do more with less in, in the sense that essentially make and data more trustworthy using like really interesting cryptography in ways that just really open up the design space for creating new and interesting applications, but also the way that we communicate. And I think that's pretty much spot on with the overarching goal of this technology. The, the trouble is that today, you know, it's really difficult to deploy with and that stems from everywhere, you know, from the, the front end and the application layer. And so you're seeing a lot of advancements in things like ZK VMs, all the way down to the infrastructure proposition of like, how do we spin these things up in a way that's consumable, easy to use and abstracts away the infrastructure complexity, the same way that like Stripe does for financial payments. And that's where we get really passionate and excited about is, you know, sure, there's like this massive opportunity. But in order to get there, we've got to cr start creating a ton of value just generally. And that's what we're all about here at Sindri. So yeah, definitely agree with the vision there. I think that fundamentally there's this perception, you know, of what we can do with it, but it really starts with cracking down some of these more like functional utility problems that are preventing us from doing some really incredible things. But I completely agree with the, the long game here. And that's what makes us really excited about it. Can I ask you both, not only is it at its core, ZK, a decentralization technology, but would you agree it's also um, a way for us to become less reliant on either centralized actors or just counterparties? Like I, the way ZK I, I is sort of always brought to life for so many is like, hey, if you need to do income verification with your bank or you, know, you want to get a loan, why do you have to disclose everything about your job and your salary? Don't they just need to know? That your income is greater than x and you don't have to tell them everything else what so but when people hear that they're like yeah that would be nice but like well, i don't really care if my bank sees my w2 like it's okay but wh why should we care about not disclosing the full suite of information to other entities it's because they keep losing that information they keep getting hacked and all of our information goes in the hands of hackers so if we can conduct transactions with counterparties without disclosing the underlying information aren't we less vulnerable also to hacks yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a first swing at it. I, I completely agree. We're actually doing a lot of work right now internally, and, and we'll be presenting at a Google ZK summit next week around the notion of verified credentials. And it, it embraces sort of exactly what you said, David, is, is how do we individuals maintain some sovereignty around the data that gets attached to submitting for some entrance or some level of verification? And when we think about something as simple as like a driver's license and it, what it's like the utility of, of that driver's license, right? It was made to essentially authorize us and prove that we are capable of driving a car. Now, what does that unlock that's not directly tied with the authority that the credential was initially given is like something as trivial as like access to bars, right? Or providing me access to some sort of funds. And alongside that gets attached like a, a lot of data byproduct. And you're putting that in into a, a warehouse of other data that's just not necessary. And so, you know, ZK starts to unlock some really interesting things just generally in, in this ever growing digital world that we're living in, where we can have selective disclosure over how and, and what and when we would like to disclose some information 
that may not be critical for the action that we're looking to actually go forward with. So that that's a, a very real thing. There are a large amount of institutions that are interested in this level of data sovereignty, and it hits very closely to GDPR. And so if I had to make a bet, it would be that we're going to hear a lot more about verified credentials, digital sovereignty, and how that ties back into a blockchain setting in the very near future. Yeah, I think you covered it super well, Stacia. I, I was just going to, David, to answer your question, from my perspective, I have a mental model where ZK is really about two things. It's about privacy. That's what everyone thinks that ZK is about. It's the name, like zero knowledge, which suggests this like privacy theme. And there's the verifiability component. I think zero knowledge proofs give both. I think the reality is that a lot more people, at least in the market today, are using ZK and are finding use cases for ZK much more in the verifiability aspect of them than in the privacy aspect. So we certainly see like examples of privacy. We've seen like, you know, Zcash was one of the first private currencies built on that aspect. But I think the verifiability is actually the thing that makes it a decentralizing force. That's my take. And it's also something I think that helps naturally extend crypto into more traditional financial institutions. So whereas it's like a, a decentralizing motion, at the same time, it allows for players, you know, in, in otherwise highly regulated environments to still participate in blockchain settings where the very things that make blockchain so incredible and powerful to a lot of people are actually like the Achilles heel of adoption for financial institutions, right? Is they don't want to necessarily like expose, you know, their books and assets. And so it provides this really phenomenal mechanism of selective disclosure where, you know, I can attest that I have some level of credibility or account balance without having to necessarily, you know, unfurl everything. Definitely. So maybe if we put on our zero knowledge hat and dive into your world a little bit. What in the zero knowledge world are people just not talking enough about? What is your insight for us today, Stacia? Yeah. You know, I, I think that it's not totally unique to ZK, but definitely in emerging markets, I think that this rings particularly true. And that is we need to be more focused on value creation in order to make this space truly thrive as compared to value capture. We spend a lot of time at Sendry sort of talking about this notion of creating value for our users. It's something, you know, we're incredibly passionate about and we think of value creation as a flywheel. And that's subsequently like the, the motion of value capture is this knock on effect, like this naturally occurring inertia that's just a, a byproduct. And I think that concept often gets overlooked or has become cliche as like this organizational ethos, but missing from the strategy function that's guiding our decisions related to this very rapidly emerging space. And as compared to prematurely architecting for a value capture posture. And so what this means to us at Sindri is like conceptually it embodies itself in this like metaphor of building nations before cities. So we want to focus on building the collective GDP first to generate these wealth multipliers. And we can do that in a variety of ways. The first is by giving people the right tools and the right resources. The second is making those tools like very highly accessible. And the third is making the consumption of those tools incredibly cost efficient. And if we express all of this in like a very basic formula, and again, we've put a lot of thought into this about, you know, driving product and driving strategy. We can think of value creation as actually just like accessibility over cost, right? So we optimize for a highly accessible, low cost outcome in order to drive value creation. And this to us has some really cool properties where like the upside can turn exponential by promoting really powerful network effects as you hit like different pockets of time and time and price elasticity and that onboards new cohorts of builders. And so I think when you map this against like other, like very rapidly emerging technology, it, it mirrors a similar pattern. And actually, you know, Jake and David, I'd love for your thoughts here. But like, when we think back to like the proliferation of the internet and the pervasiveness of AI, it's all followed this pattern of making sure that we're making it as easy as possible to put the tools in the hands of the builders in order to allow them to build some truly phenomenal stuff. 
and we can save the value capture motion for after we've created enough of this collective sort of digital GDP. But that's what I think is generally needing a little bit more emphasis is just making sure that, you know, the industry as a whole is focused on creating a ton of collective value here and making sure that, you know, we're making this more accessible, growing the addressable market and doing so in such a way where, you know, over time, there are better ways for us to, to focus on capturing value. Maybe the next thing I'd like to go to is this idea that proof generation today is being done across a number of strategies. So, you know, we're seeing some people build decentralized networks for proof generation. I think Sindri today is, it looks very much like a SaaS, you know, traditional SaaS product. And so this starts to beg for the question, you know, is the decentralization of the prover a good idea? Is it a go-to-market requirement? Is it long-term necessary, but short-term not as important? Like, how do you guys at Sindri think about running a centralized versus decentralized proving network? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. And I think we're seeing a lot right now in the space that's advocating for sort of both approaches. I, I made... Uh, well, I'm obviously biased here, but, you know, I don't think that the prover, at least today, needs to be decentralized. I think it introduces like a ton of engineering and market making complexity for what's otherwise like a very critical utility in a bottleneck. If you ask a lot of my team sort of what I talk about as it relates to, the, to this trade-off, I, I think that we can recognize that distributed compute is already a really complex undertaking. And by introducing additional layers of complexity to this model, it just creates an, a lot of like unnecessary friction, just fundamentally. This is a point in time, you know, sort of going back and stemming to some of the other questions that you were asking around adoption and sort of like, where do we see this going? Like, it's super critical that right now we need to be making things just generally easier to consume at the point of development, like, like full stop. It's also like the motion of, decentralizing at the prover is not significantly impacting the trustlessness that makes blockchains these like very magical creatures, right? So the way that I could maybe better frame this is at Sindri, we often ask ourselves, okay, like what are we optimizing for today? Against like a very ambitious roadmap towards like a hundred X in our user base, like what are we optimizing for today in order to affect that future? And if we map to that here, it would suggest that we need to optimize for UX first. Right. We need to understand how people want to consume it first and not self-impose engineering complexity, sometimes for the sake of complexity and let the customer decide what's important. So I'm not suggesting a decentralized stance on proving is wrong. And I also believe that like distributed prover models can coexist with other models. But I just think it's not clear that it's a requirement today when we're focused on growing the space. And at a point in time when the margin for error is so thin as it relates to uptime and reliability and stability that we don't want to put like a core function at risk of being misrepresented or misappropriated. So to me, like, I think it's a little bit superfluous right now. And the, the customers that we're speaking with value sort of enterprise reliability and the ease of use, developer ergonomics, clear pricing predictable uptime, all of the stuff that comes with like enterprise grade software. And I, you know, that, that's sort of what we're optimizing for today. Stasia, so if, if kind of the big point you're making is that it's important for ZK and actually you're generalizing this for other emerging technologies to try to build for mainstream adoption long before you try to extract a lot of value. Like in other words, maybe don't price it high or make it free, or these can be go-to-market choices. They can be pricing choices. But maybe one observation worth touching on is that the number of ZK proofs and verifications right now is skyrocketing. Like it feels like this is being meaningfully adopted today. Is that because you and others are making the tools work at really low cost and easy accessibility to developers? Or maybe, you know, what's driving your observation that it seems to me in your point that you must see other people focusing too much on what you're calling premature value capture rather than making it easy, cheap, and adoptable. 
Yeah. So I'd love to take credit for the skyrocketing verification of proofs. And, you know, when I think of value capture, I think of introducing like economics that are a little bit too premature. I think the, to hit on your question from, from a couple different angles, number one, like crypto is, is super unique, right? And the fact that like, there is no other market out there where like a seed stage company has the potential to price to market and have like some float indicator or indication of value, right? And so it's this notion of having like a publicly remarked price to value that sort of like creates these tendencies to over-engineer for a value capture sort of posture. And so that uh, just to clear up sort of like where I think that we need to be having more focus on value creation, it sort of stems from something that's very unique in, in the crypto that doesn't exist in other markets. I was actually talking to Seth about this point back at ETHCC, and he had mentioned, you know, the story of Instacart. And when Whole Foods was acquired by Amazon, you know, in a crypto setting, like that would absolutely potentially like ruin a protocol, right? Because of the dynamics that we just talked about. But, you know, in, in private market settings, you have the luxury of, of a little bit more patience in terms of like, how are we going to sort of retool or sort of reconfigure our go-to-market strategy? And because of that, you know, Instacart was able to work through that. And I think that the differences in this marketplace sort of sometimes drive decision-making towards something that's a little bit more value extractive. To, to hit on the, the point around verification and GK skyrocketing, I, I would absolutely agree. I, I think that one, why it's such good signal in crypto generally is because you've got super, super smart people that are building here. And, and I think that's often swept a little bit under the rug is, you know, people think that, you know, crypto is, is crypto bros and people making, you know, technology sophisticated just for the sake of making it sophisticated. When in fact it handles these problems that like naturally arise and occur in distributed compute very elegantly. And so when you put a bunch of smart people together, they're going to be able to create some really amazing product. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And the first sort of leg of that um, product release is, is in the form of layer twos, right? So how do we uh, extract as much um, volume off of the, the L1 chain in a way that makes for a more scalable environment to do more with a lower cost base. And, and I think that's where a lot of the, the verification that you're talking about is coming from. And, it, and it, it's critical. Again, it, it stems into sort of the enterprise use case. How do we make these hybrid, uh, hybrid chains and these environments where we have some level of protection? And it also allows app builders to think, you know, it, it dramatically opens the, de the, the design space on app building just by virtue of we can do this in, in a more cost efficient mechanism. But I think that's clearly like stage one of, of what is, you know, a multi-stage sort of opportunity in front of us as it relates to ZK. And as we start to see tooling become more accessible and driving down those costs, I think we'll see even more use cases of ZK across the space and also just more value add and more value creation on these layer twos that are already doing a pretty phenomenal job of, of driving ZK adoption uh, in the space as a whole. From my perspective, I think you guys are doing an absolutely fantastic job just keeping this view in your line of sight. I want to ask you a little bit about how that's possible. In other words, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about your team? This is a team that is keeping up with the latest developments, you know, and very technical ideas that are actively being developed in zero knowledge. It's a team that's developing a developer friendly SaaS product. And it's a team that's also doing a lot or having a lot of conversations with customers and, you know, creating some real traction and fundamental value in the ZK space. So what makes Sindri's team so capable Stacia? Yeah, like our team is our superpower, our unfair advantage. The folks we have building Sindri are truly phenomenal. And I know that as a founder, I'm supposed to sort of embrace the level of talent that we have, but here it's just, it's, it's incredible. And it's what it takes to build Sindri, right? So what we're undertaking, which is like 
generalizing ZK compute in a way that like abstracts the low level brain damage. And we do that from bare metal all the way up to the application could not be done without the, the phenomenal people that we have. And where they sit, it, it like our go to market is sort of based on this like multi-pillar strategy where we have to cover a large surface area that consists of cryptography, sort of platform engineering, just generally, if like, if we think about full stack engineering, and then also like heavy infrastructure. So we were talking the other day, like we don't necessarily get the luxury of like, we have a to-do list app and the app crashes and it's okay. You know, you can just come back to the to-do list app at another point in time. Like we are underpinning very mission critical infrastructure that underscores like, you know, millions, billions, if not trillions of dollars. And so we needed to build a team that was capable of doing that. And so as a result, we've got a ton of PhDs that span, you know, cryptography. We have PhD astrophysicists. Um, we also have team members that have built like really complex infrastructure and DevOps chains for like banks, like, uh, JP Morgan Chase as well. So very like high caliber team that takes infrastructure very seriously and also cryptography tasks of having to essentially convert what is like a, a very new bucket of coding primitives in the form of these DSLs and these circuit representations and translate that into something that works well against like a, a infrastructure and a hardware backdrop. So I, I can't say enough about the team uh, that we've built today. They're all phenomenal and we definitely couldn't do this without having each one of them sort of span one of these really core areas that are key to our success. It's such a multidisciplinary problem, as is always, always tends to be the case in blockchain and decentralization, deep tech. And we're super excited to be backers of Sindri and this team. I guess one of my last questions for you, Stacia, is just forward looking. Like, what, what are you thinking about the future? Like, what is, what are your predictions for the zero knowledge proof space over the next year or so? I think. You know, we've sort of touched on this question from a couple different angles. And my response generally has been like, you know, technology just has a knack for shining over time. I think how to, to, to best encapsulate the answer. So David, I, I'd watched the, the previous uh, podcast and you said something along the lines of this, you know, primordial soup where we're building infrastructure for a future that's not entirely clear yet. I think that's what you said. And we tend to say at Sindri is that we're attempting to make some processes work the way you'd imagine them working if you'd never actually tried to do it yourself. So sort of think about it in, in the same lens. And I think that's spot on for what's occurring at the infrastructure level today, and that there are a lot of critical problems that sort of stand in the way of this next step function as it relates to ZK adoption. And those span like a, a wide, it's not just like this self-isolated issue. We're talking about things like interoperability, like declawing multi-sigs, and a bunch of other topics that will really condition ZK for this next step in mass adoption. So it's really hard to say like, what are the next six months? What are the next 12 months look like? But a thought exercise we often do is we try to plot like where ZK is on the adoption curve. And right now we sort of figure out like the velocity that we can move up that adoption curve is, goes back to sort of that notion of how do we create value and how do we get the right tools in the right builder's hands at the right time. And because of that, we're able to see some really interesting use cases that are still early, but have a lot of promise. So one of those is verifying that an image was not inappropriately manipulated using zero knowledge with machine learning. Another one that I alluded to is sort of the verified credentials and being able to use ZK to efficiently prove that you have some level of accreditation without having to necessarily disclose everything in its entirety. And another interesting area that I think is going to have a lot of legs and in the public eye, but not necessarily appreciated is this notion of like, sort of like turning L2s into their own SDKs. So we think about like the OP stack, we think about the ZK sync, the ZK stack, and a lot of the Polygon CDK stack essentially making like the L2 environment more consumable and packaging, packaging that up in a way that helps propagate like scalability in L2 environments to any user that wants to spin one of those up, I think has some really powerful network effects and will actually allow sort of this like 
future based off of like 10,000 rollups, right? But it all gets back to the core of there's this perception versus the functional utility. And I know, and it, I think that like infrastructure builders sometimes get this like very bad rep and they're not doing this because it's easy, right? Like they're inspired to try to enable this really big future. And it starts with like building something that's sustainable. And so that's where we're at right now. I think that there is a little bit of gap that needs to be closed, but I do see like the applications and builders are hungry. They're building on Sindri with some really interesting use cases in mind. And we're just going to have to see what sticks, but so long as they have the right tools to iterate quickly and they have the confidence that this space and the, and the tooling will be around in 12 months, I think we're starting to make some really meaningful steps. We're coming up near the end of our time, but let me ask a sort of counter narrative question. ZK is a cryptographic set of technologies that's been around for decades. And I think the observation you and others have made is that Web3 and blockchains have given them a, a reason, right? It's really propelled them into a much more significant use. The data shows this is true, but is there a scenario where we're a little bit wrong and that let's call it non-decentralized, non-blockchain use cases flip the need for ZK and that it turns out that maybe because of all of the security breaches and all of the disclosures of people's personal data that keep happening, that maybe like traditional centralized players kind of through regulation or other, you know, public stock pressure are forced to adopt technologies like this. And that's where all the action is and, and it flips. Uh, possible future, unlikely? What do you think? Look, I hope that, I mean, I don't hope that, that I hope that there's balance in sort of the demand. The reason I, I was so quick to say I hope is because the way that we've architected Sindri again is like not specific to like a, a crypto versus a web two mandate. And so that that's something that's really exciting for us. I'll, I'll tell you this is like the, the, the main blocking factor from that happening is that these large companies and these large institutions, they just move really slow and they take a long time to adopt things. And so the, it could be staring them right in the face. But it's just a matter of getting through all of the internal processes to get there. I think that's one thing, and, and I'm not going to blame it only on them. The, the other part is that ZK right now is a black box, right? Like there's a lot of math involved. And the more that we can open that up, the more that we can create standards, the more that we can get people comfortable with what's going through the black box and maybe abstract away some of that tech, like technical complexity to make it like a CXO level conversation where people just understand it, but also understand what's happening. Like, I think that catalyzes the world that you described or the future that you just described. So I, I think it's possible. I think that the overhead, like from a computational standpoint and the DevX just makes it really, like it, it's really hard to believe that's gonna happen with the, the pace and velocity that we would like. But it's not even close to being unachievable or far from reality, because quite frankly, the, the world is in need of this sort of technology dramatically improve how we handle um, privacy, how we handle scaling information and how we, again, like make technology, you know, increasingly powerful without necessarily giving away a big portion of who we are as individuals or data that we deem is very precious and of uh, requiring high levels of protection. So I think it's a great future. I'd love it if it happened tomorrow. I guess I'm just a, more of a skeptic for that, you know, rolling out very quickly. Amazing. Stacia and Sindri on the ground and at the forefront of the zero knowledge proving space. Really appreciated having you on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sindri's co-founder, Stacia Carson. Mind, our podcast is barely a few weeks old and we're already stoking conversation about decentralization technology all over the world. If you feel passionately that we got it right or wrong, or maybe we didn't cover something we should have, let's keep the conversation going. Leave us a review. Let us know what you thought. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my handle is at jbrook, J-B-R-U-K-H, and David's handle is at pacman, P-A-K, man. Also follow Stacia at etanos, E-T-A-I-N-O-S, and Sindri Labs. S-I-N-D-R-I-L-A-B-S on Twitter. Make sure you subscribe where you get your podcasts and we'll be back soon to dig deep on ideas that are worth fighting for. Thank you. Mm -hmm.